Tonight we're going to be continuing the small series that we just began that I called The Hand of God. We're not trying to prove that God exists in this small series. Instead, what I'm trying to demonstrate is how God is involved on various levels in this world. And we began with the lecture about tragedies and then went on to Jacob's Ladder and speaking about the empires, the rise and fall of empires. Tonight, however, is a very, very important lecture that can hopefully give tremendous strength and encouragement to every one of us. And I call it Miracles Do Happen. I think it's a very important topic. Many people question if there are miracles or not. And especially nowadays when people's faith has been tremendously shaken by world events. Many are heartbroken, depressed, sad. So we all need what the rabbis call chizuk. Chizukim means encouragement, continuous encouragement, stimulation, strengthening, hope, because life can sometimes appear to be very, very cruel. And it's no wonder that you have a lot of the youth and, those, and even adults having to resort to the use of drugs to make them feel better, to make them feel high. There's obviously a sense of emptiness in many people's lives. People are, are looking for something that will make them happy. And they're having a very hard time with it. Nothing seems to be making them happy. And on top of all of that, of course, Throughout history, people have struggled with the question whether there is a God or not. Because if there is, perhaps that would help understand a lot of what's going on. Without God, really, life does not make too much sense. Things appear to be bleak. And there's, of course, the famous question that survivors of the Holocaust would tend to ask repeatedly. Where was God in the Holocaust? If there is God, how could he allow this to happen? And one of them did approach a rabbi with this question. Rabbi, where was God? And the answer came, he was with you. How do you think you survived? He was protecting you. So many people do believe God created the world, but does he also interact? That's the big question. Is he really involved with what's going on in this world? So Judaism does emphasize quite a bit that God interacts with this world. He did not just create this world and abandon it. He is involved on various levels. And one of those ways is by miracles. A miracle in essence is a manifestation of God's involvement in this world. So one way God interacts with this world is through the laws of nature. And sometimes those laws are suspended. And they are suspended in an incredible way, in a way that we're not used to seeing it. And that is why we react, wow, this is amazing. This is a miracle from the Latin word miraculous. We're amazed, we're in awe of what just happened. Because in reality, the world does function by laws, laws the laws of physics. And we tend to call it nature, even though nature in itself is a tremendous miracle. The human anatomy, the human body, is one big miracle. But the reality is that miracles, when they occur, usually do occur through nature. We just don't perceive it as that. And we just continue to call it nature. And the reason why we don't perceive it clearly, part of the reason is because we have free will. That is an important part of life, of creation, that God wanted the human being to have free will. So he disguised himself. He didn't openly announce to the entire world at every moment, I'm here. Look at me. Can't you see me? So part of the plan of creation is to disguise God. But from time to time, he reveals himself through an open miracle. When it's a big miracle, it's 
a lot more obvious, but there are many, many smaller miracles that we don't see. As the verse says, God performs many, many miracles all on His own. We're never aware that they ever happened, but they occur all the time. Because the entire creation is really one big miracle. But we're not focused, we don't even see it. So in the end, it all depends on one's perception. How does he interpret what he sees? And this perception is intentionally being covered up. And there are also forces in nature that deceive us into thinking that there's something else other than God. So we have two forces at work here. We have one is a cover-up, intentional cover-up, intentional cover-up of God's handiwork. And there's another force that is actively deceiving us in making us believe that there's something else out there. So miracles in nature, for the most part, are really taken for granted. For example, you go to the doctor, you have a very, very bad headache. And the doctor says, well, we've got to really take a closer look at this. You've had it for over a week and you have temperature and you're not feeling well. Let's do a CT scan. And it turns out when they do the CT scan, they discover a completely different problem, a much more serious problem in the stomach. Had one not had the headache, had he not gone to the doctor, they would never have discovered it. It could have been too late later on. So this was a miracle in a sense that he was sent to the doctor for something completely different and here they discover that sure enough there's something that needs treatment right away. What would you call that if not a miracle? There's obviously something going on over here. There's obviously something that we may not be able to fully understand but this did not just happen by chance. So that's what's important. We may not understand it, but we have to agree that this did not just happen by chance. The rabbis have a name for this. The rabbis tell us, En balanes makir beniso. Most people who experience a miracle do not even recognize that they had a miracle. In order to be able to have the miracle and see it, you need merits, you need zechuyot. Not everybody has enough merits to actually see and understand that what he just experienced is a real miracle. So big miracles can be defined as those that completely disrupt the laws of nature. Here we were talking about some miracles, one class of miracles where they work with nature through the laws of nature, whether it's in medicine or elsewhere. Those are more difficult to see or interpret as miracles because they work through nature. But what about those bigger miracles, the ones that are attested to the Torah and the Bible, that suspend the laws of nature completely, completely disrupt the physical laws of nature as we know them, like the splitting of the Red Sea, like the, the destruction of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. It wasn't just a regular hurricane or a tornado. It was something more miraculous or the killing of the, pretty much the entire army of Sancherev, the Assyrian army in Jerusalem. So there are many such miracles that are attested to in the Torah and the Bible. And of course, those that don't believe that this ever happened are losing the opportunity to, to learn for themselves that they, in fact, do happen. It's just a matter of perception. How else would you call it? What else would you call it, if not a miracle? So what is the purpose of a miracle? Why does God perform miracles? The simple idea behind a miracle is to awaken people's faith, to strengthen their faith, to give them hope, to remind them not to give up. As the rabbis tell us, even if you're under the guillotine, you're about to be hanged at the gallows. Don't give up hope even at the last minute. A miracle can happen. Your life may be spared. I may have shared with you the story of my sister's father-in-law, may he rest in peace, who was in Auschwitz as a young man. A whole group of them, they were sent to the gas chamber. And they're in the room. 
They're about to release the gas. The doors are closed. That's it. They're about to die. At the last minute, the door was opened and a German soldier came and said, I need you. I need a bunch of you guys immediately to do some work here. The last minute. One would have easily given up hope. There was no chance. A miracle. But would you call this a miracle? What is that? There's something else to that, obviously. It's not just a miracle. There's something that I will talk about soon called Hashgaha Pratit. In Judaism, it is well known that God interacts with this world through what is called in English divine providence. He directed this for some reason. So it's not just a miracle in the way it happened. There's a reason behind it. He's directing it. He wants it for some reason for this to happen this way. They could have stayed alive in some other way. We don't know why it happened that they went into the room in the last minute they came out. But it's definitely a miracle. There are many stories of people who were about to be killed, whether it was by a gun or in some other fashion. At the last minute, the gun jammed. It didn't work. The trigger, he tried pulling the trigger, didn't work. He even tried shooting elsewhere and it did work. So he aimed it again and it didn't work. What do you call that? Many stories, including of a family member of mine who was at the gallows. They were going to hang him in one of the concentration camps. And on two or three occasions, the rope tore. He fell down. It didn't work. And when they saw that, the Germans, they just let him go free. They were freaked out. They couldn't understand it. And they said, well, you just earned your life. They somehow let him go. They could have shot him. They could have done other things to him. But they understood on their own. Somehow they figured it out. Wow, he's a lucky man. That's the way they looked at it. Lucky. Obviously, we know that this is a miracle. Miracles occur through messengers. They could be doctors. They could be angels. They could be even souls that have departed from this world. There's an incredible story that I like to tell from time to time about a widow who had a very successful business and during the years that she was doing very well, she supported a school of scholars. All she asked was for that, that they should say the prayers for those souls that have departed, that have no one else to say the prayer for them, no children and the like. That's what she asked for. She was a very, very charitable individual. But eventually her business did not do so well and she lost a lot of money and she had no way of supporting that school anymore. And here she has a few daughters to marry off and she had a very hard time making ends meet. And she was very, very sad. She didn't know how she was going to support the school, marry off her daughters. And she's walking down the street one day, thinking to herself, how am I going to do it? And an elderly gentleman approaches her and asks her, what's wrong? Is there anything that I can help you with? And she tells her her story, that she needs right now desperately some money to marry off her daughters. He took out a check and asked her how much she needs, and she told him, signed his name. But before he signed his name, he says, I want two witnesses that they should come and testify that this is in fact a check that I wrote. It's not a forgery or anything. It was a large sum of money. So she immediately ran to that school that she supported and asked for two young men to come and be witness. And they witnessed this man writing the check. He told her where to go to cash the check. So the next day she went to cash the check and the lady, the teller, saw the signature and she was in shock. She said, this can't be. She immediately called the president of the bank. And he too was very, very surprised. He says, this is a forgery. This can't be true. And she said, no, this is true. This is a real check. I have witnesses. Who gave you this check? This element elderly gentleman who I met in the street. So the president of the bank took her into his office and pointed to a whole bunch of pictures in the wall. Can you point out the, this individual that you say 
gave you the check. And she pointed to him. And he immediately fainted. The moment he got up, he explained to her, this is my father who had passed away. He's not amongst the living. And he has been coming to me recently at night in a dream, criticizing me. How come you never do anything for my soul? You don't say the prayers. You're not observant anymore. It's only due to that lady who's been paying and supporting those scholars who've been praying for me that I got some sort of salvation in the upper world. This man now understood what just happened. And he, of course, gave her the money. The moral of the story is not just, oh, look at this miracle. This story tells us a lot more. Look, we see for a fact that the soul continues to exist in a different dimension, in a different realm, after it departs from this world. It also tells us about reward and punishment. Look how this woman was rewarded. This story is an incredible story to which there were witnesses. This is not made up. They saw this man. Where did he come from? Obviously, she merited experiencing this miracle and this financial help that she needed. Some people say, of course, if you only show me a miracle, I'll believe. <laughs> There's a saying, one who believes in God does not need miracles. One who does not believe, no miracle will help him. No matter how many miracles you show him, he will still not believe. So miracles is not exactly what makes one believe. They can strengthen one's belief, they can awaken it, but that's not what's going to prove it. And the reason for that is because a lot of things that happen we attribute to freak accidents. Well, statistically this is not really normal. So it's a freak accident, or they call it luck, or they call it mother nature. They don't understand what's behind it. That God is actually involved in some way, and they don't see it that way. If one really wants some proof that there are miracles, that there is divine providence, I think the best uh, example for that is the story where a king actually approached one of his priests and asked him, can you prove to me that God exists? And he says, sure, the Jewish people. <laughs> Just the Jewish people, their history, what they went through, that in itself should be sufficient to convince one that there is a God in this world, that there's something called divine providence. But I, I very much believe that if one would really pay close attention to all the prophecies that came true, we're living now in a generation where you can actually see all the prophecies that came true. They have been fulfilled, where the Jewish people are going back to Israel, and many, many more prophecies. You clearly see the direction. You clearly see that there is a plan. This could not have been forged. This was written years ago that this will happen. And look, it's happening. So the fulfillment of the prophecies is a very powerful proof that there is a hand of God, as we are calling it here, directing these major events in the world. So this is one way to be able to see miracles through seeing the fulfillment of the prophecies. But then comes the question, what about witchcraft? Maybe this is witchcraft. Yeah, I have a whole lecture about that, witchcraft. There are definitely other powers out there. We began to say that there are other powers who try to deceive, deceive us into believing that they are actually some sort of power. So I'm just going to briefly tell you how to distinguish between a miracle and witchcraft. All the powers of evil, all the impure forces, what they have in common is a koach hata'aya, as we would call it in Hebrew. Their power is to deceive. That's their intention here. That's what they're aiming at. So if you can see somehow what they're trying to accomplish, you may be able to tell. They don't have their own power. They're not completely independent. And that is why it is possible, if you know how to cancel their power, Whatever they do, and it may look like they do something very, very interesting, it's still temporary. It's not something that will last. 
And more important than that, it's very limited. They cannot split the Red Sea. They cannot do major things in the world, that what we would call a clear miracle. If they can do anything, it's on a very small scale. They're very limited. But what really describes their function is evil, destructive. It's not something good. So you can see their fingerprints from time to time. If you somehow came across witchcraft, you would see that this is a destructive force, not a helpful force. It's deceiving you to believe that it has some power, that it's independent, that it can control you. But that's not true. So the Torah warns us about these powers. The Torah understands that they exist, and we should always know it is possible to do certain things with witchcraft. So what, which one is it? Is this coming from the good source or the bad source? The only thing that we need to know when we see something so amazing is to find out, to ask ourselves, is this coming from the pure forces or from the impure forces? The fact that it exists, we know. The Torah describes it, talks about it, and prohibits it because of the danger of eventually being, of being associated with idolatry. So now you understand too why one of the reasons why the Jewish people had to spend time in Egypt, and that's where the miracles began, is because the Egyptians were experts in witchcraft. And if they would be able to distinguish and admit, hey guys, this is, this is the hand of God, this is not witchcraft, if they're going to say that, and they're going to publicize it, then the whole world will understand that there's a God. There is a real God who is in charge of everybody, of everything. This is not witchcraft. So they, were, better than anyone else, could attest to that because they knew what witchcraft is. They knew the limited powers of witchcraft. If you were to experience a real miracle, you would actually feel it. You would be able to, through your senses, understand that this is a real miracle. It somehow communicates differently than witchcraft. The impure forces act in a completely different way. And if one is sensitive to this, he would notice the difference. It may take time, sometimes it may be difficult initially, but through proper investigation you would be able to figure out this is not positive, this is not good, this is evil, this comes from the impure forces. Ultimately, the miracle, the goal of the miracle is to strengthen or to awaken one to faith in God. A real miracle has the power to do that. Witchcraft will not do that, never. Because it is destructive, it is not helpful, it is not good. So that is why Maimonides points out that the Jewish people never believed in Moses because of the wonders that he performed. Because they could have been tricks, they could have been witchcraft. The only reason they actually took upon themselves the yoke of it's sort of the commandments was because they heard the voice of God, otherwise they would not have believed Him alone because of what He performed. Yes, it's possible to deceive people, and that is why they, that generation, had to testify to this very important fact. We observed that we heard something. We were convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is divine. This is not witchcraft. Very, very easy to deceive people. People can actually be fooled very easily. And because of that, that's why all of these forces out there that exist, the impure forces, are for the most part concealed. We don't see them. We don't have easy access to them. In the olden days when people actually wanted to, to do something like that, they actually had to learn it. They actually had to travel to faraway places to meet with people who specialize in this. And it still exists to some extent. But it's not rampant, and it's not in the open, because otherwise people would really be confused. And God does not want people to be confused. He doesn't give them all the power in the world. Otherwise, it would be impossible to tell right from wrong, truth from falsehood. So in the same way that we can figure out where this is coming from, when prophets wanted to give a message, we also had to investigate them. Is this a true prophet or a false prophet. There were many, many false prophets with false messages. Incredible. But 
we have a record on this. We had to really check them out. And there is a way to check out if what someone is saying is the truth or if it's false. In other words, if he claims if he's a prophet from God or not. A lot of people would gain tremendously in life. They wouldn't be so depressed, they wouldn't be sad, and they wouldn't suffer all kinds of ailments if they actually believed that their situation can change. A lot of ailments, a lot of problems that people have is only because they have given up. They don't really think that there is a possibility for change, and they are depressed. One of the ways where one can express his hope for change is prayer. But to who are you going to pray? And why should you pray? Because maybe there is such a thing as a miracle. Maybe God does exist. Maybe He does listen to my prayers. So prayer is a very powerful medium through which one can express that hope. And that hope and that prayer will hopefully relieve the person from the pain that he's in, from the depression that he's experiencing. And the more one believes and the more one prays, it is definitely possible that he will experience, he will merit a miracle. We have a clear tradition to that effect that many times a miracle happens only because of one's strong and steady faith. He believes in God, he believes it's possible for him to change the situation, he doesn't give up hope. And even though the doctors are telling him there's no hope for this sick individual, or some other problem that this person is having, never say there's no hope. If you believe in God, you believe in miracles, it is possible to change, as it has happened to many. I recommend that people should read books about miracles. There's a series of books called Small Miracles, a beautiful series of all kinds of miracles that happened to different people. I highly recommend it. It's very encouraging. It demonstrates clearly the hand of God, how He's involved in all kinds of ways. We sometimes don't realize that initially, but later on we look back and we say, wow, look at what just happened. How could this happen? We're amazed. But it's not enough to just be amazed. We have to make sure that we attribute it to the right address. How could this happen? Only because he wanted this to happen. He allowed this to happen. There is a nice saying, and I don't re recall who said it, but it says as follows. There are only two ways to live your life. One is as though nothing is a miracle, and the other is as though everything is a miracle. I highly recommend, next time you hear something in the news, about something that is miraculous, rethink. Rethink what just happened. Why is it that certain people were saved from a plane crash? Whether it was that they were in the plane and it crashed, or whether it was that they just missed the flight. They were supposed to be in the flight, regardless. Or why is it that certain people, initially, when they went to the doctor, they were diagnosed with a tumor, and upon a later visit, the doctor says, I don't know what happened, but the tumor disappeared. It was there. Here's the x-ray. How does this happen? What about, sometimes you hear in the news, a baby, a child falling off a balcony from the third, fourth, fifth floor, and it just happened to be at that moment that he was falling, somebody was passing by and he caught the baby. I mean, how come? Just as he was falling, somebody passed by. Rethink a little bit, what could these things be, if not the hand of God? One of my favorite stories that shows a miracle, that shows divine providence in an incredible, powerful way that was quite convincing is the following story that happened to two Russian soldiers in Afghanistan. If you recall, the Russians invaded Afghanistan. There were several years there. There were two Jews, one who was a believer in God and one who was more of a, an agnostic. He did not believe in God, or he wasn't sure. And they always had discussion between themselves about God. Does God exist, not exist? 
and here they're going to Af Afghanistan. But one was headed in a totally different direction than the other. So the one that was headed towards the battle zone in Afghanistan had some experience with zoology. He was an expert with snakes. And uh, that's what he was going to do. During his free time, he was going to look for snakes. But before they parted their ways, before they said goodbye to each other, the soldier who believed in God told the, the other one who did not believe in God, just remember, whenever you're in trouble, just call out to him, call out to God, and you will see that he will answer your prayers. Whenever you're in trouble, remember that. Okay. So when he arrived in Afghanistan, the first thing he did was look for the holes where the cobras are. He knew exactly what to look for, and he found one, and uh, became actually friends with this cobra. He fed him from time to time. Whenever he had a free moment, he went to the hole. The cobra came out, took his food, went back into the hole. He was an expert. He knew how to deal with snakes. And this went on for some time. It just happened that on the last day that they were going to be there, the captain told everyone to make sure they packed the bags and meet at this and this location because they were about to leave. And this Jewish soldier asked permission to say goodbye to that cobra, to his friend. And said, okay, go ahead and do what you need to do, but come back right away because we're leaving. So he went to the cobra one last time, put some food next to the hole, and as soon as he put the food next to the hole, the cobra came out quickly and stood up, erect. And this is an expert, he knew right away what this means. He knew that he was in danger, he was not allowed to move. He would be uh, bitten by this very poisonous snake. And he was in shock. They were friends, what happened now? Okay, he figured, that the, the cobra is going to go back down soon. But half an hour, an hour, the cobra is still standing. The cobra doesn't let it move. The cobra appears like it's going to attack any moment. So he's just stood there, he was frozen. An hour, two hours, three hours or so went by until finally the cobra went down, back into the hole, and he immediately ran, took what he, what he had with him, and he didn't see his friends anymore. Everybody was gone. What do you do now? So he decides he's going to follow the tracks. They were on an armored personnel carrier. And he followed those tracks. And he was able to see where the tracks were leading to. And he finally catches up with that armored personnel carrier. And what does he see? They were all ambushed. They were all ambushed by the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. They were all killed. Now, let's go back a little bit in time. During those three hours, what do you think the soldier did? He had a lot of time to think. And uh, he remembered what his friend told him. So during that time that he was facing the snake, he says, God, if you really exist, please help me out. He prayed. He prayed to God. Sincerely, intensely. And after that prayer, that long prayer, apparently the snake went back into his hole and he was able to go to his friends. But look at what happened here. He realized that those three hours were crucial. That's what saved his life. Had he been with his friends, he would have been killed. That snake saved his life. That snake was a messenger from God. God has all kinds of messengers. So during that time that he was frozen on his track and he couldn't do anything, he had time to do as his friend told him to do. When you're in trouble, turn to him. And he said to God, God, if you exist, please help me out. He not only helped him out, he saved his life. And of course, that was the beginning of a new life because he completely changed his beliefs. He now realized that this is true, that our faith is, is true, 
And eventually, I believe these two soldiers emigrated to Israel when the Iron Curtain came down. It's an incredible, powerful story because it proves not only miracles, it proves that God works in all kinds of ways to save people's lives. It shows divine providence. The fact are that miracles happen every day if we're willing to look around. So look deeper and one day you will discover how you yourself are a great miracle as well. Amen.